last month's journal, Lawrence uh, Miller wrote an article about digital inclusion. Of course, since then, we've become painfully aware about the absolute importance of connection digitally. But there are many people who do not have this opportunity and are excluded. So I'm delighted that Lawrence has recorded a video for us talking through the needs and the problems of digital inclusion and also giving us some ideas about ways forward from here. So thank you, Lawrence. Tena koutou katoa. Ko kada idris te monga. Ko otaki te awa. Ko kelts te iwi. Ko ipurangi te hapu. Ko 2020 trust te marae. Ko Lawrence Miller aho. Thank you, Sheena, for that introduction. I'm Lawrence Miller, and I've been working for the 2020 Trust in governance and leadership roles for the last 10 years. Our vision is that every person in New Zealand is able to fully participate in the digital world. Ka taia tato katoa o Aotearoa, ka mahi ai i te ao matihiko. I'm going to use that experience to talk to you about digital inclusion and why it's particularly important in the midst of this pandemic. I'm going to talk about four things. Firstly, the challenge of digital inclusion. Then what's needed to meet that challenge. What's happening right now and what could the future look like? So firstly, what's the challenge of digital inclusion? If you're watching this video, you probably take the internet for granted. But in this pandemic, we've all had to come to terms, um, come up to speed with different ways of working. Zoom for meetings, working from home, WhatsApp calls to family and friends, both here in Aotearoa and also overseas. Online ordering, online entertainment. And that's in addition to the practices that we've already had embedded in our lives through email, social media, and gathering and publishing information on websites. That's the way we look at the world. 20% of households in New Zealand do not have internet access, according to Census 2018. So when we go covid19.govt.nz, we know what to do. 20%, up to 1 million New Zealanders, don't know. What do we know about these 20%? We worked on a stock take in 2017 and published a report called Pulse of Our Nation, which identified seven groups that were at risk of digital exclusion. Families with children in low socioeconomic communities, people living in the rural areas, people with disabilities, Migrants and refugees with English as a second language. Maori and Pacifica youth. Offenders and ex-offenders. Seniors and older New Zealanders. Recently, DIA commissioned Motu Research to update that. And they also identified seven groups that had at risk of dis digital inclusion. Slightly different list with quite a lot of overlaps. Their lists included people living in social housing, disabled individuals, Pacifica, Maori, people living in larger country towns, older members of society, and unemployed people. Now, although those two groups, although those two lists are different, they do have one thing in common, which is that they are all large users of government services. And that's important to IPANS members. I'll come back to this later, but before taking up that up, I will talk about what's needed in order to respond to the challenge of digital inclusion. There's general agreement in New Zealand and overseas that digital inclusion is made up of four components. The first is affordable access. This means affordable access to the internet 
and affordable access to a suitable device. The government decided to invest $1.5 billion in ultra-fast broadband a few years ago, and it's now clear that that, is, that was a wise decision that is showing its benefits and reaping its rewards now that we are all in lockdown. But there are still suburbs in New Zealand where less than half the household have access to any internet, whether it's dial-up or DSL, and God forbid fibre. I hear a lot of people say, but everybody's got a smartphone. Everybody doesn't have a smartphone, especially in those groups. And even if they did, cell phone data is expensive, which is why a number of um, young people go to libraries or go to McDonald's to get the free Wi-Fi that's available there. Not anymore. It reminds me of the time when we used to have dial-up as the only option. And you said, I'm going to internet now. And you went off and you interneted for 10 minutes or half an hour, dependent on the affordability of your plan. And then you stopped interneting and you came back to your real life. I'd wager that everybody that's watching this video no longer go off to do internet and then come back to their lives. It's part of the way, it's embedded in the way we work. I'd also take issue with the fact, with the smart smartphone as being a diff suitable device. It's good for a lot of things. I'd say it's not good for school homework, school assignments. I'd say it's not good for preparing and submitting a resume in order to get a job. There are many online government forms which it doesn't, it's not good for, and it's got accessibility challenges for the disabled. So affordable access means affordable internet access, where you need to use it, and it means a suitable device to use it on. The second area of digital inclusion is skills. You've got so many digital skills that you don't know about. How to use a mouse, how to complete a form, how to navigate a screen, how to read emails, how to send emails, how to forward emails, how to delete emails, how to stay safe online, how to distinguish between genuine and fake information, how to search for information. The list goes on and on and on. These are all part of the way you work and they're embedded in our daily lives. So we need to teach some of those basics to our learners. We do teach some of those basics to our learners. We start our program with two components, one of which is those basic skills, how to turn on a computer, how to, how to access, how to set up an email account, how to use a keyboard. We've learned that teaching people how to do things is not actually the best way for them to learn. Which brings me to the third component of digital inclusion, which is motivation. And the first thing we ask people on our courses on the first day is, why do you want to get digital skills? And they give us a number of answers. I want to get a job. I want to apply for a job. I want to proceed to a better education. I want to keep in touch with my family. I need to check government information, particularly work and income and immigration. And so dependent on what they want to do, we help them learn how to do it, how to create an email, how to create a video, how to complete a form, how to get a real me ID. When they, when they say, how do I do X? We don't say, this is how you do X. Any of you with teenage boys will be very familiar with that as a unsatisfactory learning experience. Indeed, instead we say, okay, let's find out how to do it. We go to Google. We say, I want to search, create a video, or I want to apply for special assistance. 
how to find out the information and learning how to learn. And from those experiences comes the fourth of the components of digital inclusion, which is confidence and alongside that trust. I remember the first time I did a blog post when I was a senior public servant about 12 years ago. I wrote my opinion and I pressed post and there it was published for anyone to see and available in perpetuity online. I found that quite a scary moment having lived within a cocoon of managed information distribution. But now we all post our reckons online without even thinking about it. And confidence and trust comes from experience. And it's now embedded in all of us. So those are the four things that people need for digital inclusion. They need affordable access, including internet connectivity and a device. They need skills, they need motivation, and they need confidence. So next I'm going to talk about the response. But in order to think about the response, we need to think about who we're responding to. I said that those different groups of people identified in those two reports had one thing in common, which was that they're all high users of government services. They have another three things in common as well. The first is that they're suspicious. They're suspicious of government, they're suspicious of banks, they're suspicious of companies, they're suspicious of officials, they're suspicious of schools. Many of our learners, if we try to get in contact with them, won't answer their phone because they don't know the number that the phone call has come from. Many of our learners live in a very low trust. The second one is about learning needs. Think back to a time when you helped an elderly relative use a computer or connect to the internet or send an email or create a document or connect a printer. It took a lot of effort. It took a lot of explaining. It took a lot of demonstrating and it took a lot of repeating. Learning for people in these groups is a high touch experience. They need a lot of interaction. And the final characteristic that many of them have in common is that they're financially challenged. Now you're probably not aware, but in order to get an internet account, you have to sign a direct debit form, which authorize, authorizes the provider to take money out of your account every month. Many of people in those groups are not in a position to be able to manage their finances like that. I'd just like to give a shout out to Spark Foundation for their Jump product. It's a prepaid modem that plugs into the power socket in your um, living accommodation and works. You still need to get it to work, but that's what teenagers are for. And it's prepaid, which is a game changer. But generally, what we're looking at with the final 20% is a market failure. If any of the people in those 20% were a viable commercial proposition, they would be connected by now. We've got a classic market failure, classic case for government intervention. Most of the focus at the moment is on the affordable access and to some extent on the devices. And we're seeing a lot of good work taking place. So we've seen Chorus and uh, UFF, ultra fast fibre, being two wholesale providers of fibre connectivity, providing that connectivity for free to the ISPs for a period of six months as a consequence of the pandemic. We've got Network for Learning looking at ways that they can extend, extend the school network into people's homes. We've got the Ministry of Education building information on families that don't have internet or devices at home and shipping out Chromebooks to them. We have a problem during lockdown level four that new installations and the high touch that I was talking about is not available or inappropriate. 
but we are seeing some momentum that will drive connectivity. But government digital transformation requires a much wider and a much deeper response. Census 2018 showed us what happens if 20% are not connected. Every government agency that delivers services will benefit from universal connectivity. And this pandemic has shown just how important it is. But it's not just about having an internet in the home, and it's not just about having a device. As I said earlier, it's also about the skills, the motivation and the confidence. And that only comes from working with people, through people that the learners trust. So for instance, in South Auckland, we, te we, we teach learners, Pacifica learners in Samoan and Tongan working through their churches. That's how we need to think about building the future connectivity for the remaining 20%. A number of people have said to me, especially in the first few days before and during lockdown, see you on the other side. Some of you may have read an article by Arundhati Roy in the Financial Times titled, The Pandemic is a Portal. She makes the point that the portal, the pandemic is a portal, a gateway between one world and the next. There is no normal to go back to. We are going to create a new world and we have the choice about what new world we're going to create. New Zealand has shown during this lockdown that caring for each other is a core value that most people in this country share. We should build from this experience and create a new social and economic system that includes everybody. There have been quite a few discussions over the last few years on ideas such as a universal basic income or universal basic services. My preference is for universal basic services, and typically that includes accommodation, heating, food, education and health. I would add to that list universal basic internet. I stress the word basic. Netflix is a premium product and people should be expected to pay for that, like they pay for Sky TV. But basic connectivity to access information and essential services must be universal. And we've developed a feel for what essential services means over the last three weeks. Digital inclusion ticks many of the whole-of-life benefits targeted by the well-being budget methodology. Research data, based on our experience of learners graduating with digital skills over the last 10 years, the research data shows that measurable improvements in employment, education and community deliver a substantial return on any government investment. Now is the time to start preparing for that. Now is the time to start preparing your services to be delivered to everybody. I'd like to take questions, but I don't think that's going to work. So instead, if you have any comments or any questions that you want to ask, feel free to contact me by email. And I look forward to your responses. Tenakoto, tenakoto. Tenakoto Katoa.